This video will present the proper technique for transtracheal airway wash in the dog for VMC 937. There are several different catheter options that are used clinically to perform this procedure. Probably the most commonly used one these days are long Myla transtracheal wash kits, but we'll also use a variety of through the needle style or intermediate style intravenous catheters. For purposes of the laboratory, we're going to use the Becton Dickinson intracasts. They come in 8 and 12 inch lengths. 8 inches is uh, rather short for a good sized dog, but it's the one we're going to use in this demonstration. Skin preparation is performed with a dilute solution of Etiderm soap. These dogs have extremely sensitive skin and are very prone to getting rather severe rashes if we use surgical scrub. So we're going to use cotton balls, this diluted dermatology approved soap, and rinse thoroughly with sterile water. In addition to rinsing thoroughly at the time of the skin prep for the procedure, I'd like you to wash the skin really liberally with wet paper towels at the end to remove every little bit of soap as possible. If we leave any soap on these animals, they will definitely get a rash. Additional supplies that we need include large syringes, either 35 or 60 mil syringes as shown here, that are preloaded with about 5 mils of sterile saline solution. You'll also need a 3 mil syringe with a 25 gauge needle that has 2% lidocaine that we'll use to block the skin. Aspirate about 1 to 1.5 milliliters of the lidocaine solution. Position the dog in sternal recumbency, then palpate the trachea and work your finger up to the cricoid ligament at the base of the larynx. This will be the location to center the clip. Remember to clip carefully and keep the blade of the clipper as flat and parallel to the skin as possible. Note that in this demonstration, we're not doing a great job of that, and the clipper is being held at a little bit of an angle. That's going to have consequences later, as you'll see. So go as gently as you can, and remember, keep the blade as parallel to the skin as possible. You don't need to clip more than perhaps um, a circle of around 2 inches in diameter around the center of the cricoid cartilage. So if anything, this clip is a little bit more generous than we need. So she's wiped the excess uh, hair and dander from the skin, and then we're going to proceed with a lidocaine block of the cricothyroid ligament. Prior to cleansing the skin, we're going to block the cricothyroid ligament. Holding the syringe in your dominant hand, use your other hand to palpate the trachea, then work your finger up to the cricoid cartilage, place your index finger on the symphysis between the left and right halves of the cartilage, and then use that as a reference point to guide your needle just over your fingernail into the, through the skin and into the cricothyroid ligament. So here, as soon as we inject into the skin, this dog reacts and pulls away. And rather than struggle to keep up with a moving dog, we're going to stop here and let the skin block do its job so it can make the rest of the procedure more comfortable for the dog. So we're going to wait a couple of minutes and then come back, repalpate to identify our landmarks, and inject the needle through the now numb area of skin to block the deeper structures. So this time there's very 
little reaction to the injection. We can inject lidocaine ahead of the needle as it advances, enter the cricothyroid ligament, and then aspirate to confirm that you're getting air. Notice here that we screwed up and the needle must be off the midline because we've got a vacuum instead of getting tracheal gas. So we back the needle out, repalpate our landmarks, and try again. And this time we have success and we can aspirate air from the trachea. Now you need to tip the syringe up like so to get the bubble away from the needle. And then you can inject a little bit more lidocaine into the lumen of the trachea and subcutaneous tissue on your way out. So we're going to start injecting and inject while we withdraw the needle. It's important to have that air bubble away from the needle so you don't inject air subcutaneously. Before we lose sight of the area, we're going to scratch an X into the skin very gently. Uh, you shouldn't be able to see it, but once we prep the skin, it's going to form a little bit of a wheel at that location that will help you identify where exactly you block the skin. The prep should be done very gently with the cotton ball soaked in ediderm, and because we're not using a surgical scrub, the point of the prep for purposes of this lab is simply to cleanse the skin. So it's only going to take you two or three cotton balls and 15 to 30 seconds of gentle wiping to cleanse the skin. If this were surgical soap, we would need continuous wet contact for a full two minutes for chlorhexidine or three minutes for betadine. But our goal here is to simply cleanse the skin carefully and completely remove the soap with water. We'll next use an 18 gauge needle to make a facilitation incision in the skin by injecting directly into the blebbed area and then remove this needle. This will make a little hole that will allow us to pass the intravenous catheter th more easily through the skin. The catheter is passed to the operator in an aseptic manner and the cover from the needle needs to be removed prior to use. We'll then find our landmarks on the dog's neck again, hold the index finger on the cricoid cartilage right over the symphysis, and then with the bevel pointing down, advance the needle through the hole in the skin. Sometimes the easiest approach is to identify your landmarks and then let go of them and tent the skin with that uh, same hand to lift the skin wound away from the neck and advance the needle of the catheter apparatus through the skin wound only. Then repalpate our landmarks, get the finger on the symphysis of the cricoid cartilage and advance the needle directly on the midline just over the fingernail of the hand that's palpating the symphysis and use that as a landmark to guide you. So now the needle needs to go straight in and it should go with minimal resistance. There's often a little pop experienced as the catheter goes through the cricothyroid ligament. And there shouldn't be any kind of firm resistance like you're seeing here where the neck is being indented by the force of the needle. This is a strong sign that the needle is not on the midline and that we're actually pushing it into the thyroid cartilage. There was what appeared to be a pop, but that was likely the, cap, the needle sliding off the side of the thyroid cartilage. So the operator lifts the needle up to direct it more down the trachea, and she's going to try to advance the catheter here to confirm that she's in the trachea lumen. As it turns out, she's not and there's some absolute resistance to advancing the catheter and you can see the catheter uh, buckling on itself within the sheath. So this is essentially a guarantee that we're not where we want to be. So you now need to pull the entire apparatus out as a unit. Do not try to back the catheter out of the needle. You risk amputating the catheter and leaving it in the dog. So pull everything out together as a unit like so. And we'll try again. So another try. We're going to go through the same little hole in the skin. Repalpate our landmarks. 
try to have learned from the previous experience what went wrong. This time it went in very easily by comparison, so that's a good sign we're in the right location. And it advances with essentially no resistance. Most dogs will start coughing when the catheter goes down the trachea. And that's another strong sign that we're where we want to be. So the catheter is, sli is slid through its sterile sheath all the way to the needle. And the green catheter hub is seated on the, the needle hub. Next we're going to back the needle out a bit. And then holding the needle with our left hand, you can rock that plastic sheath off of the needle hub with the other hand. So we'll back it out a little bit. Pinch the needle, and then rock this sheath connector or adapter off of the needle hub, like so. Take care to not withdraw the catheter while you're removing the plastic sheath that was over it. At this point, you can withdraw the needle so we can cover it with this needle cover that's going to prevent the sharp end of the needle from amputating the catheter. Notice that that channel is oriented so that the large end of it is at the needle hub and then it's uh, clamped like a clamshell around the needle. At this point, the operator made a mistake and didn't guarantee that the catheter was in the channel. And when we back it out just a little bit, you'll see that there's a that the catheter is coming out at an angle. She's going to um, firmly seat the catheter hub into the needle by pushing and twisting the two together, and then holding the green catheter hub will pull the stylet out. Be sure to hold on to the catheter so that you don't accidentally pull the catheter out of the needle at that point. So here's why it's important to make sure that the catheter is in the channel of that clamshell device. It comes off at an angle and that means that it's been crimped shut by the clamshell and you're not going to be able to inject or aspirate any fluid. So we have to open this thing up. And sometimes that's easier said than done. But she'll split this apart and then make sure that the catheter is seated in the channel properly. and clamp it shut again. Sometimes these are very hard to clamp and you have to really squeeze hard to get that plastic tab to clamp on itself. It was not too bad in this case. So now you want to inspect the catheter and make sure it's coming out of the, the channel as it's supposed to. And we're in good shape here now. So at this point, we're going to connect the syringe with saline to the catheter hub and do our first injection. So it should be around 5 mils of saline drawn up in a large syringe. And then inject the entire amount rapidly and immediately begin aspirating. If you have trouble injecting here, it's quite possible that you've kinked the catheter at the point of insertion in the skin. So pay attention to where the end of the clamshell is relative to the skin and that there's no kinking uh, at either the exit of, through the clamshell or entrance into the skin. So with that junction straightened out, you can inject freely and then immediately aspirate. If you can't aspirate, again, check for kinks, straighten them out, and aspirate away. Notice that this fluid is pretty bloody looking, and that's a consequence of the bit of trauma we had with the misplaced needle initially. You should eject the air from that 
syringe and then use the same syringe to aspirate again. In this example we're using a new syringe but you can use the same syringe a couple of times to try to aspirate every bit of what you injected. Here we're injecting a second 5 mil aliquot of saline and immediately aspirating again. Getting a little bit of, of uh, blood tinged fluid back in this sample as well. So this simply confirms that we're in the airway. We're getting some fluid, in this case blood tinged, and a bunch of air so we know that we got a, a, a sample out of the lumen of the trachea. If our sample is of diagnostic quality, we're done with the procedure and you can just pull this catheter straight out like so and apply a little gentle pressure to the injection site with your thumb. Then come back in a few moments and gently cleanse the area with more water and really wash it thoroughly to get every little last trace of soap out of the area. Any residual ediderm left on the skin is going to contribute to a rash on these dogs and cause us to have trouble. While you're doing that, watch for any residual bleeding. Unless there was much trauma done to the site, um, there should be minimal swelling and bleeding from this procedure, and we don't routinely need to put a neck wrap on these dogs. But if you had a particularly hard time and there was some trauma to the neck, then we may need to put on a light wrap. You can ask the instructors for help making that decision. Here's our uh, diagnostic sample with the air expressed out. In a clinical patient, the sample would be distributed typically between at least a small aliquot for cytology and another aliquot for culture and sensitivity. If we had multiple syringes with multiple samples, then we're in good shape and we'll have plenty for those tests plus others like special cultures for mycoplasma or other fastidious bacteria or other types of diagnostic tests. Remember how at the beginning of, the, of this video I mentioned that the clipper was being held at an improper angle? Here's the consequence 24 hours later. So this dog has a pretty good rash developed and it's a combination of probably some microtrauma from the clipper blade along with the, the prep with soap and water. The dogs in the laboratory generally have extremely sensitive skin and it's really easy to cause harm with improper clipping or too aggressive washing or failure to remove the soap. So be very gentle and careful with your clip job and gentle with the soap and thoroughly rinse all the soap off the skin. At the end of the lab you should rinse their neck with paper towels soaked in water and just really liberally wash the whole area. This is also the reason why we apply Mometamax uh, steroid uh, lotion to the skin at the end of the procedure. That'll help cut down on this type of inflammation.